And welcome to another episode of the Raw Shock Test Podcast. I am your host, Terrell James. Today, I got a special guest with me, Kevin Cassidy. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing good, Terrell, man. Thanks for having me. That's good. Thanks for showing up, man. Thanks for showing up. Um, So wanna, we're going to really get into, you, you have a really interesting life. And uh, <laughs> you have an interesting story. You have an interesting choice of an uh, uh, interesting line of work. So... Uh, you are a stuntman, a Hollywood stuntman. Yeah, 17, almost 18 years I, I was a Hollywood stuntman. Yeah, it was a fun ride. Okay, and you also have a book. And we'll, we'll talk We'll talk more about, about your book later. Uh, but uh, Falling Down to um, to Find Myself. Name of that book. So we're going to we're going to also get into that book, which I, I like that, um, that, that play on words. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, falling Down to Find Myself. I really like that. With you being a stuntman, I think that's pretty cool. So... Um, now, before we we put these pictures up here, um, well, for anybody, if it's your first time watching, what I do here at the Raw Shock Test podcast is I put up a series of ink blots or Raw Shock Tests for uh, my guests, and I ask them what they see. So based off of what they see, I link it to who they are as a person and to their passions. So in this case, we're going to be talking about Kevin being a stuntman. Um and of course, we, like I said, we are going to get into the book. But before we get into the pictures, so just tell me, Kevin, like what was it that made you decide that you wanted to be a stuntman? Uh, man, for lack of being corny, I kind of fell into it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but uh, I was a, uh, I was a minor league baseball player, low level, independent minor league ball after college. Mm -hmm. And then I, I was a teacher in Baltimore, Maryland, outside DC. So mm. I was an education background. I've uh, okay. been tried to be a mentor and do, do stuff for the youth. And that's kind of what I, I followed that passion. Mm -hmm. And while I was in Baltimore, I was, you know, young and dumb and had a lot of energy. And I uh, found a sport called slam ball, like full contact basketball and trampolines. Okay. We got on TV for a couple of years and they had a tryout. And me and my buddy went to it in Philly. And, uh, out of nationwide tryout, like 25, 30 new guys made it, and I made it. So mm -hmm. they shipped me out to L.A. to play slam ball, and I was like, oh, I'll ride. I'll, I'll do this. Free trip to L.A. <laughs> and uh, met a guy who was a stunt guy doing that. Became friends with him. Uh, and kind of one thing led to another, networking, communication. What are you doing? I'll come out to L.A. and see if I can get in a movie or something. And Got another one, got in another one, and 18 years later, I'm looking for an escape out of that move, out of that business. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Short story. <laughs> got you. Okay. All right. So now we're gonna go ahead and get into uh, one of these pictures here. So we're gonna start here. Okay. So what was it that you said you saw here? That one was the easy one for me. That was an eyeball. I looked at it real quick. Well, that's someone looking at me. That's uh, the pathway to the soul. The eyeball. Right. Okay. <laughs> So that's the that was the easy one. Anytime I, I haven't I have a bunch of different uh, ink blots that I you know show people, but every time that I've shown this one, I've probably shown this one maybe about three or four times. Everybody sees the same thing. Everybody sees an eyeball. Right. Sometimes I just kind of throw it out there, depending on what the person does. Because I'm like, okay, maybe they'll see something differently. That's what everybody sees. That's what I see. I I keep looking at this, trying to see something else. That's all I see is an eyeball. Um, so, but I want to talk a little bit about you growing up. So when you, uh, growing up, you were born with a facial deformity. Yeah. Uh, then, a severe cleft palate. So when I was born, um, my here, from here down was a bubble. So okay. there's no nose, no, uh, nostrils, no roof of my mouth, no nothing mm -hmm. from, from here all the way to here with a bubble all the way back. And uh, affected my speech. I grew up doing speech uh, speech pathology classes and mm -hmm. had different kinds of contraptions in my mouth to get. They took bone out of my hip to make the roof of my mouth. So uh, I didn't have any teeth for a while. Didn't have a nose for a while. And had a bunch of surgeries growing up to uh, slowly correct it to be as beautiful as I am now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> and I'm glad that you actually said that because that's actually where I'm going with that. But because we're talking about this eyeball here. So I want to talk about how you see yourself, but I want to go back to childhood though. So you were bullied as a kid because of your facial deformities, right? Mm -hmm. So, but how did you see yourself? I always, I, I think, and I write this in the book, I always saw myself never as a victim, kind of 
one thing I got to go through, and it was kind of a blessing. I had to wear mine on my sleeve and my face for <laughs> be accurate. Okay. That I couldn't hide from it, you know, get in front of it. I was always very social, and I didn't hear myself talk like other people heard me. Mm -hmm. um, I was kind of a blind spot, and I guess a lot of people do that when they hear their voice for the first time on, on film. They're like, ooh, I sound like that. It was <laughs> even different for me because I don't, I still uh, have to slow down and do speech you know, lessons and all that. Mm -hmm. But I hear myself fine. I know what I'm saying, so I'm one step ahead of it. So um, even back then, it never really slowed me down until the you know teasing and the chirping. And, oh yeah, I forgot that. You no, know, I I don't talk right. Or I look like this. Or but you know, I had a short memory. I was playing sports. I was very social. You know, nature and nurture. Who knows? You know, which, which a little bit of both probably. Right. Uh, but I was I was always in the mix. I never kind of I never hid from it and never thought I was really any different from anybody else. I didn't take any ownership in it. Um, mm -hmm. I was trying to do so many different things. I never really let it sink in that, hey, I'm the kid who talks funny or looks funny, or you know. And I was always a pretty tough kid, so I was I was quick to uh, make them commit if they're going to do so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the other thing about the the eye, the eyeball is, so the 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 white part is called the the sclera, and that sclera is actually to protect, is for protecting the eye from injuries. And it's pretty tough. But as tough as it is, it's still pretty sensitive because it's the eyeball, right? So I want to talk about you being, you know, to be a stuntman, you have to be pretty tough, right? But how sensitive are you? I'm getting better. I'm getting better. As a as a child, I you know swallow everything, and keep it all inside. As as a man, I kind of do that a little bit too. But uh, mm -hmm. the older I get, the more mature I get. The the more I've always been very empathetic and very sensitive to to other people, and not very sensitive to myself. I always put other people okay. ahead. I'm like I'll be I'll be fine. I'll figure it out. I'll right. take the I'll take the beating. I'll know tomorrow I'll be all right. Uh, but this mm -hmm. other person may not. Let's be really kind to them. So I. I don't know about again nature and nurture. I was built that way, or but I've gotten gotten better. I have three daughters now, so that that really softens you up. And mm -hmm. I have a, a six year old, a four year old, and a two year old. So mm. uh, yeah, I'm in the trenches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are. <laughs> so, so, uh, do you do you think that some of of you being so empathetic? Do you think that that has anything to do with what you went through? as a kid as far as being teased and knowing what it feels like to be on the opposite end of that yeah absolutely uh i don't know if you know what going through as an 8 9 10 11 12 year old that that's what is being built in you empathy for mm -hmm. others because you don't like right. the way it feels but at some level that's what growing up is whether you're completely normal good looking athletic you know you're going to find that that area where you, you cross the line and learning where those lines are is part of you know maturing and going through adolescence so but definitely looking back, uh, for sure, made me, because I went through a lot of stuff, and that was always fine. So I'm like, I, I'll handle it. I'll be okay. But I saw other people go through things that weren't as severe, I would say, and we have a really hard time with that. And I was always like, wow, why? that wasn't that big of a deal. Why are they so mad about that? Then I would kind of like try to get into their head and you know help them out a little bit more because I thought they needed it more than I did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So do, do you think that you're more sensitive now, especially since you have daughters, than you were when you were a kid? Yeah, sensitive, but also um, I, I, I'm a little less forgiven. I'm like, as a kid, I didn't know, hey, you're, you've done this eight times in a row, man. Get up. You got to do it. You got to figure it out on your own. You gotta, I'm okay. a big tough love person. You need to tough and you need to love. Right. I think we've, uh, we've fallen out of the tough a little bit. Some people need to be Hell accountable to get a little tougher because they're never going to get yeah. tougher unless someone demands it of them. So right. I see now a little bit in the kids I coach and the things I'm involved in now. I'm uh, I'm still very empathetic, mm -hmm. but I'm trying to get something out of them. So mm -hmm. I see it at a deeper level a little bit now that I know where I can push and try to make them tougher because at the end of the day, that will make them happier and more resilient people. So, mm -hmm. so what are you uh, coaching kids in now? So my business, I have a Ninja Warrior gym. Uh, so American Ninja Warrior, we do camps and teams and birthday parties. And it's a big 11,000 square foot warehouse that has all the Ninja Warrior uh, stuff you see on TV. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm involved in that. Um, I own it, so I'm definitely involved in it. 
I have a, uh, I left Hollywood to be closer to my family and everything. So I'm, I'm doing preschool drop off. I'm a stay at home dad with a full time business. I just wrote a book and doing podcasts. So I'm, uh, my youngest is two. When she goes to school, I'll full time coach that more. But I'm always uh, coaching kids in the neighborhood, baseball, and you know, I'm, I'm always I'm always out there. You, know? mm-hmm. you say you're doing podcasts. You mean uh, you're a guest on podcasts, or you have your own podcast? I'm a guest right now, mm-hmm. but that's the next step. I'm gonna do both. I'm gonna learn how to do it. You know? well, okay. I mean, you got. 17 of them so which one more i'll throw my name in your hat <laughs> <laughs> right yeah come on over i got you right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay all right so let's get into another picture here so right here okay what did you say you saw here so i saw a spider right away mm-hmm. but when i looked at it a couple more times i saw like a santa claus with sunglasses on <laughs> a rastafari <laughs> a rastafari and santa claus with sunglasses on. <laughs> <laughs> it might be a, a more fun one. In Santa Claus. <laughs> you know what's funny? Yeah. I don't see the spider. I see the Rastafarian Santa Claus. Okay. That is so freaking hilarious. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm going to try to come up with a question for the Rastafarian Santa Claus, but we're going to deal with the spider for right now. Okay. 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 So with spiders, um, people, much like my wife, my wife is terrified of spiders. A lot of people are scared to death of spiders. But I want to talk about you growing up and even even um, not just childhood, but even as an adult. Like, what were your fears? Um, regret was always my biggest fear. I never wanted to look back and say, ah, I should have done that, mm-hmm. which got me into things I probably shouldn't have done by yeah. doing it. But I just, uh, no, no, big, no big regrets. That was kind of my fear. Regrets uh-huh. and, and the unknown. Like, I... Like I think a lot of people are scared of spiders because can it kill me? Can it not kill me? I don't know. I'm gonna kill it. Uh, right. Uh, the snake the same way. The unknown, the, whether it can hurt me or not, I don't know. So I'm taking it out. Uh, right. So I didn't want to have any of those unknowns in my life and leave myself, you know, doubting what could have been or you know, putting myself out there. So my two fears were probably not putting myself out there, which is probably odd for people, and mm-hmm. uh, uh, correlates to spiders, I guess. So. Mm-hmm. Well, the the fear of not putting yourself out there. Uh, was it a fear of failure? Because if you felt like, you know, I know we, you know, people say, you know, nothing beats uh, failure, but to, tr- but to try or how, I, however the, the saying goes. <laughs> but if you're trying, then you don't, I mean, that's the only way to not fail is if you try to accomplish it. So do you think that you had a fear of failure? No, I think I, I kind of almost the opposite. Like you only fail when you stop trying. Like, okay. you know, I never lost a fight. I just ran out of rounds. <laughs> or, uh, yeah. <laughs> or, uh, uh, so it was more of a regret from that. Trial. I was fine with failure. I failed every day. I failed multiple times early in my life. And um, even small things like the speech impediment, the bullying, all, mm-hmm. all the, the surgeries. And, you know, I got a lot of small little failures. And the more you get hit, the more like, oh, wasn't that big of a deal. Oh, wasn't that big of a deal. Cool. So then it's not hard to, you know, leave my teaching career and go to Hollywood to see if I can be a stuntman. If I fail, I go back to being teaching. So I never really had that fear of failure. I had more of the fear of regretting not trying, not going out there. Like I've never stayed in my little safe space to be like, okay, well, I have this. I don't want to get out there. I get out there and see what happens. It's, mm-hmm. uh, it's my mentality. Right. I Look, I'm with you 100%. I, I've told people that uh, when I'm on my deathbed, I'm probably going to have a lot of regrets, but I don't want any of those regrets to be something that I did not do. Exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. so, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you 100%. Okay, so um, the other thing about uh, spiders. Okay. Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. I want to talk about deception. Um, smoke screens. I want to talk about the smoke screen that is Hollywood. So. To the viewers, Hollywood is bright lights. But when you get behind that smoke screen, how dark does it get? Uh, it's a lot of layers. A lot of, I, I call it very compartmentalized. You got the construction workers building the sets. You got the stuntman training the fights. And you got the producers doing the money and the directors being artistic and the actors being. You got so many different worlds. They're all kind of colliding. And it's like walking down the big hallway or some. Some are nice, brightly lit, and everyone's high fiving. The others are kind of shady and dark, and you kind of got to navigate that whole like haunted house. Uh, luckily, and what drew me to being a stuntman, well, 
I'm more athletic and I'm good with my body and I obviously don't talk great. So I never really wanted to be in front of the camera talking. Uh, so I'm like, I can yeah, beat me up, throw me over the, give me the money. You can have the fame. I, I, I'd rather <laughs> use my body and, and get in there. And in the stunt world, there's no agents, no managers, no auditions. It's all word of mouth. And back when I got into it, a bunch of old really? cowboys, the cowboys ran the show. The guys that did all the old eighties and seventies shows. Mm -hmm. Um, and you got to get in with them. There's a stuntman softball league, a stuntman golf tournament. There's horseback riding and car driving classes. And you go to different dojos and you train with different people. And you kind of just build a network. And then, you know, hey, I got this guy. I need someone your height and weight. You know, you show up and do a good job. You put them on your list. You check in with them. You run your own business mm -hmm. that is separate from that was kind of established by old school cowboys. Have that good grit, you know good mentality, hire the right people, do a good job, show up early, you know, mm -hmm. keep your mouth shut, that kind of, and um, so that kind of existed outside that haunted house that was Hollywood that had the, once you get into auditions and you have agents and managers, everyone gets a piece of the pie, everyone has different uh, incentives, financial or otherwise, and power, and that whole world gets really dark pretty quick. Even mm -hmm. in that dark world, there's a lot of bright lights, there's a lot of good people who can, who can live in that world and not get too far deep into it but mm -hmm. it trash it attracts greedy people it's uh it's the ultimate get rich quick scheme people right. go out to la to be a they're a waitress one day and they're a millionaire the next day and famous so that's happens mm -hmm. every year so it's very attractive to those people who want that that fame right but those people don't go to stunts you got to earn it in the stunt world so we're kind of protected from that from that darkness a little bit mm -hmm. but we're hip to all of it <laughs> right okay so that's interesting that you don't have to audition uh, um, so, so you've never been presented with the casting couch, then? <laughs> 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 well, when you when you're starting out stunts, you're gonna get work one day a month, maybe one day every two months, and you're building your network. So, a lot mm -hmm. of stunt guys will do. I do like extra work and background commercials, or I'll do like, hey, show hey, there's an audition for a football commercial or for a baseball commercial. You're an athlete. Mm -hmm. I'll go to that audition. You know, mm -hmm. that's more. Of, physically demanding like i need a guy who can play football at a high level cool i'll go i'll, I'll see if i can get that job you know so you okay. kind of go to some of the auditions some of the cattle calls for that stuff my first movie was the longest yard or mm -hmm. adam sandler Burt reynolds that remake right. there's a big mm -hmm. tryout for it in la all the guys who just got out of usc and uh out of the nfl they need something to do so there's a, a combine run the 40. it was a big sports tryout to get onto that movie to be a stuntman Wow. So that's kind of a casting call, but it's more of a physical, you know, it's not as dark. There's no agents involved, managers, and, you know, the conflict right. of interest isn't, isn't as high. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's funny you brought that up. I wanted to ask about two movies that, that you've done. So you've done uh, The Longest Yard. And then the other one I wanted to talk about was the, was Black Panther. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And just what it was like being on set, being a stuntman. Well, actually, what? So going back to Longest Yard. So what was your role in uh, Longest Yard as a stuntman? I was the free safety on the inmate team. So okay. uh, all those scenes in the jail, I was in the jail. Uh, and, mm -hmm. the, um, and those scenes are kind of the extra, just in the background and next to Chris Rock. Or they want continuity, the same guys who are hanging out with that team, be mm -hmm. the same guys in the football field doing the stunts. Okay. So we, we played our own character. We didn't have any lines, but we were always there. And then we put our helmets on, and we did all the hits and tackles. And So I was the free safety on the inmate team. Okay. Uh, so all the all the stuff in the jail, the 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 um the water scene, which all was raining, and all the fight stuff in the cafeteria, and mm -hmm. then there's a part in the scene where like Michael Irvin, all the black guys come in, like they, and they're gonna help us actually beat the guards, mm -hmm. and then the team got different people made it different. The final team was the team mm -hmm. that played the guards in the uh in the final scene on the field and everything, and I was I stayed on. I was the free safety of that team as well. Okay. All right. And what about in Black Panther? What was your role there? By the time I got to there, I was mostly behind the scenes. Like you're now you're a boxing coach. You're not getting mm -hmm. hit in the face anymore. You're right, pointing yeah. fingers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I was I was pointing fingers on, on uh, Black Panther, helping uh, with the fight choreography, helping wrangle the stunt people. Uh, and there's a big subsection of stunts called stunt rigging, where Black Panther is going to – there's a scene where – all the guys are on top of him. He does a superhero and then he runs out. Mm -hmm. And we had a, a wire on each one of the guys that were surrounding him that, you know, they, they you know, pile up on him. 
he does the superhero thing and they all go flying. But we mm. do that in real time. We put a wire in each one of the guys. We have big cranes and big pulley systems and uh, hydraulic uh, air compressed ratchets hit a button. The guys go flying. And some guys are what we call hand pulls where they're, there's a rope goes to them up the pulley system down to a big rope and I'll jump off that rope to yank another guy out. So the hmm. whole behind the scenes of, of stunts that stunt guys also do. I used to be the guy on the wire getting thrown around. Now I'm the guy helping design how the wire is going to best work, to what angle the director wants him out. Is he going to fall on the pad off camera or are we going to see him hit the ground on camera? You okay. might not throw him as high as you hit the ground, you know, uh, <laughs> or hire different guys. You're going to have to do that because you got to do it four or five times in a row. Don't get hurt the first one. You won't be hireable. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> okay. So the other thing, I'm going to put the picture back up because you said you saw when you looked at him, you saw the Rastafari and Santa Claus. So uh, I'm going to try to come up with uh, a question really quickly about that. So this is going to be a silly question. Santa Claus is make believe he's in the air, he's flying through the air in the sled, which means that he's high. A lot of times we associate Rastafarians with smoking weed and getting high. So you're in the Hollywood business, right? There's a lot of drugs, <laughs> a lot <laughs> of drugs. Is there a time that you saw somebody that seemed like they were so high that they were just seeing make believe things? Yeah, uh, not on set so much, but yeah, around playing sports or slam ball or anything you're involved in, you're going to see a little bit of that. Mm -hmm. a, a funny, I just do a lot of uh, creature work where they put prosthetics on your face and become an alien and you do a fight scene as an alien and whatever. So a lot of these trailers you'll go in on the, on the movie set they, to get the, the prosthetics on, you're there for four or five hours sometimes doing makeup to turn you into an alien. And I have all these little drawers and all this stuff to grab your little tools, do stuff. And a couple of times I see a drawer pulled out and it's just a mirror. It's a flat mirror on top of a drawer. Like, oh, that was from the seventies when you didn't have coffee, you only had cocaine on set. So <laughs> <laughs> there's a, uh, before my time, but that kind of seemed like the industry standard of uh, a little bit of uh, a little bit of a white powder instead of a little bit of a uh, cup of coffee. Yeah. Uh, again, before my time, a whole different day and age. But mm -hmm. uh, I bet back then, and also back then, there was the same five guys doing eight movies. So they would go for one movie set, eighteen hours a day, sleep in the mm -hmm. car, and drive to another movie set, and jump a car and go to another mm -hmm. movie set. And right. I'm sure actors and directors. It was, it was a wild, wild west. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I bet there was a lot of people kind of bugged out back then more so than now <laughs> they needed something to keep them awake with all of that all those long hours <laughs> yeah. moving from set to set so yeah you know five hour <laughs> energy back then <laughs> exactly exactly more than five hours i'm sure for that. <laughs> okay so all right we're going to the next picture here all right so what did you say you saw here uh two football players colliding okay you know, they got helmets on and their feet mm -hmm. on the bottom kind of shoulder to shoulder on us Mm -hmm. Okay. So two football players colliding. So uh, when you're watching football and you see two football players colliding, you see um, two people who are from two completely different worlds, probably coming together and causing a collision. Has there ever been a time where your two worlds, your Hollywood world, your real world have come together and caused a collision? Yeah, it's a, a pretty good example of that. Uh, I was in London and Prague doing Spider-Man Far From Home, and I was behind the camera again. I would drive a car every now and then or get in the fight scene, but I was hired to be the behind the camera rigging side of the stunt department. And uh, I had a two-year-old and a six-month-old at home, and I was over there for three, I think three months. And you're, you're, you're working. They own you. So for three months, I'm overseas. I came home for one weekend for my daughter's second birthday. I uh, flew out, I think, after work Friday night and flew back Sunday morning back to London. Um, and those were the two were like stunts as a young man's game physically. But mm -hmm. I was able to be get behind the camera, do the administrative stuff, which was great. But then the hours shoot up, your phone's ringing off the hook, you're trying to organize stuff, you're talking to the director, you're, you're doing the budget, you're, you're on a team that kind of does a lot more. So your hours shoot up and they, they kind of own you, which is fair. They pay you enough for it. I mean, mm. there's a price tag for that. And, uh, right. so, uh, fair. 
but those two worlds of family or Hollywood, you know, they couldn't, couldn't do both. Well, it could. I have a lot of good friends who do both. Their wives don't work. A lot of times they'll take their family to location with them and they'll just live in London for six months while they're working on the movie or live in Australia. And it's pretty cool. Well, at some point, even them, they want to put roots down and stay home. Their wives and kids travel less with them because the kids are getting older. They're getting into soccer. And mm-hmm. So I, I saw that right on the wall on that. Like, if I got to make a call, you know, I'll put this on hold. I'll go back. I'll open the business. I'll do other stuff until my kids get to school age. And I always put a foot in there. I always have connections. And I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina. And a lot of uh, filmers in Atlanta. I lived in Atlanta for five years. So I can shoot down to Atlanta, work on the movie a couple of weeks here and there. I got all my connections still. So I've never been out of the game completely, but you know, when you're in, you know, can you work for nine months? Where? I don't know. No, I can't <laughs> I can't I can't get nine months away from the family again. I don't want to do that anymore. So yeah. my wife works full time as well. So we're uh right. we're, we're busy people. What's the longest you've ever had to stay away from your family? Probably that was the in London for the three months because the okay. distance was so great. If I was in, in LA, I can fl- shoot home for the weekend. I've, I've done a lot of movies in Pittsburgh or you got in New Orleans and you can always, you know, jump on the flight and, and it's easier to see each other every now and then. But when you're mm-hmm. overseas and, you know, you kind of, you got to really commit to come back. So that was a big gap. Right. Yeah. Did you ever try to fly her and the kids out? She flew out and left the kids at home. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> a two-year-old and a six-month old, that's not fun to fly overseas with. No. Uh, so when they get a little bit older, we'll, we'll, we'll be more active to do that probably. But, yeah. <laughs> that's not fun to just drive down the street with the two-month-old and a six-year-old. Like. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So – um, the other thing uh, we're, we're talking about here, I'm going to put the picture back up. So this is the one you said you saw two football players colliding. So um, oftentimes, you know, the the as a result of the collisions in football, there are concussions. Um, so now going talking about being a stuntman, have you ever sustained an injury that I'm not asking you if you've ever sustained an injury because I know you have. <laughs> Have you ever sustained an injury that has made you uh, question the long-term effects, kind of like with concussions and CTE, you know, the long-term effects of the concussion, but have you ever sustained an injury that made you wonder what are the long-term effects of this particular injury? Luckily, not really. I like, I did um, a lot of motion capture for video games. So I did NFL mm-hmm. Madden. I was a linebacker at all the hits in Madden. So okay. fly me and like four guys or five guys up to Vancouver, get in the, the motion capture studio and you're hitting each other you know, all day long. And those sustained, I did, I think seven years of that. And then they kept getting younger guys to do it. And mm-hmm. I couldn't catch them anymore. They were like, action. I, you got to tackle. I can't catch you. <laughs> you got to hire someone slower or you got to hire me anymore. I can't catch that guy. Um, right. <laughs> so, uh, but that like the football, the repetitive stuff, wasn't mm-hmm. really a big issue in stunts because if you're doing a big stunt, you're doing, you're trained. I call it con- control chaos. Like mm-hmm. I've gone pretty high out of a window doing a high fall, and you can go do a high fall into an airbag, or they put a line on you and it's a winch, so it's kind of like a fishing line. You free fall, and they slow you down and they lower you, which to me is scarier because there's concrete below you and there's a line on your back, mm-hmm. and it's not on your control. Like I hope this line doesn't break. Right. Well, the airbag is on me. Okay, I know I can do this. I've trained this. I've practiced this. I can fall into this airbag. Mm-hmm. So you train, and it, like I said, it's all word of mouth. So if you don't really know me, but my best friend says, hey, Kevin can do this stunt. Uh, you're vouching for him? Yep. You call me, hey, can you do this stunt? And I say, yes. I show up next day, and we got to do it. If I'm lying, you never hire me again. I'm blacklisted. So you only mm-hmm. take the job at first that you know you're going to shine at. So I okay. always under promised, over delivered, um, and that. So if someone called me to do a backflip on a motorcycle. I'm like, hm, not your guy. Call somebody else. I don't know how to do that. Or mm-hmm. too high out of a building. No, not your guy. Call somebody else. Or mm-hmm. a couple of times I was doubling the guy. Like, hey, tomorrow we're gonna try this. You think you can do that? Like, I could try, but you know, eh, we can give it a shot. Pretty athletic. So be upfront and honest, so you don't put yourself in those situations. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not. I said, not the repetitive, that's really going to get you, but I, I have friends break their back, break their neck. I have a couple of friends that have died 
You know, they, mm. they weren't they weren't even like big crazy crazy stunts. If something goes wrong, you're falling from eight yeah. feet and you go the wrong way and mm. you, you miss a pad and it's uh it's definitely risk involved. Um, right. But we train and you only put yourself in a situation where you think you're gonna you're gonna succeed. Um, mm. and if you don't, you won't have a career. So right. mm. I, I was lucky enough to kind of slow roll it and mm -hmm. get enough work and, and the football stuff was I like to imagine like we were hitting each other along a shard and the gridiron gang i did a hit like 82 times in a day just getting run over run over run over to <laughs> get uh, uh, so some of that's a young man's game i can't do the same i didn't get out of football and start doing fights where they pretend to hit me and i don't react <laughs> <Right. you know? laughs> i don't actually get anymore <laughs> let's hide it with camera angles let's not run me over for real anymore uh -huh. <laughs> That was kind of the, the progression of it. So, mm -hmm. what what is what's it like that impact hitting that airbag? What is that like? The, the, is there any pain at all when you hit that airbag? If you're high enough, yes. But now it's so dialed in. Well, the first time I trained it, it was at an old Sun guy's house. He was training high falls, and I have either have good air awareness or you don't. Like when I played slam ball, we went to the tryout in L.A. And some of the best basketball guys get on a trampoline. They got three feet off the ground. They didn't know where they were. They didn't have that innate air awareness. Some people have it, some people don't. Mm -hmm. You couldn't pick right. it out of a lineup who's going to have it. I have a decent sense of air awareness, so I knew you know where I'm comfortable falling. Mm -hmm. And back in the day, I maybe 20 feet up, looking down on this airbag, and it looks like it's caved like this. And if you hit the side of it, you, you get about, you're right in the middle. Mm -hmm. The airbag won't hurt you, but if you miss, you're getting bounced off. And then... Uh. But now that was an old school airbag, probably a duct tape on it. And now you're up there and they have these designs that are cave like this. If you hit the side, it comes in on you. And mm -hmm. you're going 40 feet, they'll get an airbag ready for 100 feet, just in case. Mm -hmm. So you, you always train to fall as smooth and flat as possible in case you go higher and higher and higher. Mm -hmm. Well, technology's gotten so good, unless you, you're not where you're supposed to be. Um, or a lot of times, like doing high falls, if I'm just standing there and jump, fine. But they may light me on fire, turn me around, and throw me a punch, and now I gotta find the airbag. Oh, that's that's a different stunt, you know. Mm. There's a lot of or go through glass, and when you're right. going through glass, you never know how hard you have to go through it because they they hit it and the spiders, but it's still there. And then you break through it to go out. And sometimes you really gotta bust through it. You don't want to hit it and just bounce back. Right. So, but if you go too far, you'll go past the airbag. Airbag. So. There's a lot of variables before you hit the airbag that really lend to the, the danger of those high fall stunts. But mm -hmm. airbags nowadays are pretty big and cushy, and there's always a risk, but they, they've yeah. come a long way with the technology. The movie studios figured out that it was uh, cheaper to let us practice and get better technology and then pay for all our medical bills. Yeah, I would <laughs> imagine. <Yeah. laughs> what, what's the highest that you've had to jump from? I've done 70 feet. Okay. Uh, I wouldn't go any higher than that. I was a little out of my comfort zone. I was a little lighter back then, a little, uh, a little smelter. Uh, <laughs> but that was just in training, too. That was just walk, look straight, go. You know, it wasn't another big um, variable, like I said on this movie set there. Because if you're hiring some people, okay, your job is to go 40 feet out of this window. Can you do that? Yes, sir. I'm your man. Great. Mm -hmm. Show up to work the next day. And the jury, you know what? It'd be really cool if you went to the top. Well, yeah, it would be cool. That would be really cool. Uh, <laughs> but so when they get that call, like, hey, I can do 40 feet, but I'm not much comfortable higher than that. So just to be safe, you should probably hire someone who's comfortable at 80, just in mm -hmm. case it ranches up. But yep, my guy can do that, no problem. Everybody looks like a hero. Everybody wins. And I'm mm -hmm. not there like, yeah, let's do this. And that's how you get hurt when you just you find yourself in a situation where you're just kind of out of your out of your realm. And you got to make a call. Go for it or or – sorry man. it's out of my league yeah. right yeah yeah man i um <laughs> i you know i think i was telling you before we before we got on here that i was i when i was a kid i wanted to be a stunt man you know and i used to jump around on my bed i was doing all these flips and stuff <laughs> acting as if i was a stunt man and then reality hit me and was like you don't want this life so <laughs> i'll leave it to kevin i'm not <laughs> i don't need this <laughs> it's good it's a good thing to know <laughs> yeah yeah you gotta know what you built for that's right that's right for sure <laughs> <laughs> all right man so look right now we're at a point in the show where what i call uh flip the script yep. so what i'm gonna do is i'm turning two of the pictures 
I'm going to turn them upside down. One of the pictures I'm going to turn on their side. Okay. okay. And I'm going to ask you, I'm well, first I'm going to tell you what I see. Okay. Based off of what I see, you can ask me a question. Any question, it doesn't matter how ridiculous, how deep, how whatever. Ask me any question you want to based off of what I see. Okay. okay. So this is the you said the football, mm -hmm. right? For football players colliding, right? So this is that same picture turned upside down. So what I see here, it looks like at the top, there are two people on both sides. They are, they. it looks like they have two sharp weapons, um, not necessarily swords, but sword-like weapons in their hands. And they are pointing them at, it looks like some sort of danger. I don't I don't really can't tell what's coming at them, but something is coming at them and it's pointing at them right underneath them. They look like babies. So maybe these two people up there with these with these sword like weapons, they are protecting their children. But it, it, it looks like two babies um, that are on their backs. Well, they look like they're floating, but, you know, on their backs and looking up while the parents are protecting them. So that's that picture. So here's the other picture. This is where you say you saw the eyeball. And I turned this one on its side. And on the side, I still see an eyeball. But what I see is a side eye. And people, when people side eye people, they, that means they, they're looking at them kind of funny, you know? So that's what I see. So this one, it's not so much about what I see. It's about what it makes me feel when I see. And what I feel when I see this is like I'm side eyeing somebody, like something's not quite right, you know. Um, then your other picture, this one, this was the one where you saw the spider and then you also saw the Rastafari and Santa Claus. <laughs> and upside down, this is the picture. It just looks like a monster to me. It looks like a monster, and in the middle, the monster has two. Um, it's either two thumbs down or two middle fingers. <laughs> either way, if it's two middle fingers or two thumbs down, neither one is good. So, <laughs> but that's what I see on on those three pictures. Okay, so which one of these pictures do you want to use to ask me a question? Uh, I'll go the first one. The first one. The so swords and the babies. The swords with the babies. So this one right here. Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, I'm curious, are the people you see, because the top, I see the swords going out and kind uh -huh. of faces facing each other, but you see them back to back fighting mm -hmm. outwards? Yep. I see them back to back and the swords are going out. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, I, that says to me of a sense of community. You, you uh, fight for your village. You probably have a a strong friend network, a strong uh, family, mm -hmm. strong protecting people who can't be protected. That kind of uh, uh, you put a lot of importance in that. Uh, you know, takes a village to raise yeah. and protect a kid or people or get the get the general community that you want out of it. Yeah, I'm I'm really really big on the village, mm -hmm. um, not just as it pertains to the children, but to the people in the village period you yep. know that if you're a part of the village then the village protects you regardless of whether you're a child or adult um yes i'm i'm really big on that and um the people around me again like you know i'm a you know boxing coach and you know training to be a krav maga instructor i am really big on protection um and it just protecting but not only protecting yourself physically but protecting yourself emotionally, protecting yourself psychologically. And I think that a lot of that has to do with the people around you as well. You have to make sure that you surround yourself with people who have your best interest and people who everybody doesn't have to think and feel like you. But having the same moral compass, um, having the same type of understanding, and even when you all don't understand, just understanding that I'm not going to always understand. <laughs> You know, I think even that, even something as simple as that is part of protection because it is even is if, if you, if you're saying something that I don't necessarily agree with or that I don't necessarily understand, if I don't judge you, 
if I still accept you, if I still love you, despite the difference in opinions, the difference in feelings, the difference in viewpoints, then I still am protecting you. Yeah. Because if I were to use those things that we don't have in common to be divisive, and then I end up attacking you, well, that's the opposite of protection. <laughs> so yeah. I'm very big on protecting those around me. Uh, everybody who's in my village, very, very uh, protective of those people, their thoughts, their feelings, you know, whether I agree with them um, or not. Now, of course, there are levels to that because if you do something that is completely egregious, well, I have to protect my peace and the peace of everybody else in the village by removing you. <laughs> you or, or, I mean, to start, you have to build a, a, a respect framework. I respect you. We're on the same mm -hmm. moral compass. We have all these already dialed in. So mm -hmm. now we can just agree here and here. But right. the respect and the moral compass weren't, weren't already aligned. Then it'd mm -hmm. be harder to, you know, give you a pass what we disagree with. Um, exactly. As long as those, those things are aligned, then maybe mm -hmm. he needs help being pulled back in or held accountable so he can make the group stronger and eventually get cut off if that's what if his moral compass has changed or the respect you and he or him have um is at a different level because of action. So but for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we don't have to agree on everything, but if we can agree on the moral compass, <laughs> we we're good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's it's like it's like pizza. Like pizza. <laughs> we don't have to agree on the same toppings, but if we agree on pizza. That's all that really matters. We know that we're on the same page. We want to help. We want to help people, right? Cool. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's it. Um, okay, man. Look, I want to talk a little bit about your book now. All right. So here's your book, Falling Down to Find Myself. So, what inspired you to write this book? Well, I always had, um, I guess, a mentorship in my blood. And I was a teacher and I always want to be around and, and help uh, not mostly kids, but anybody who, you know, who, who's vulnerable or it can use it, you know? And um, I knew I wouldn't do Hollywood forever. And I've always dabbled in writing and wrote essays and wrote stuff. I always, it was an outlet for me, even when I was younger and uh, getting bullied and everything, I would write stuff. I mean, just, it was an outlet that uh, I always enjoyed. I was decent at, but not, not great at, but I always dabbled and had different you know, writing projects on my list. And I knew I wanted to do like some uh, speaking when I got out of Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Great that I had a Hollywood career I could, you know, catch the people's eyes with. And then it comes down to the uh, the birth defect and the bullying. And I moved from New York to North Carolina when I was 10. And I got arrested in college and uh, pretty crazy um, charges that were eventually dropped. Like I kicked out of college because of it. And my father passed away. And a lot of things happened in my life. And then I went to Hollywood, became a stuntman. And... Um, so a lot of trials and tribulations that also have a lot of good stories there. So that thing, after my Hollywood career, I really wanted to share just kind of what I went through to help some people, uh, mm -hmm. especially, you know, middle school, high school kids, college kids. I think a lot of it, the big focus in the book is uh, who over what, like who you are, moral compass, character, all that matters more than what you are, stuntman, athlete, whatever. So mm -hmm. being grounded in your who is... Well, I think a lot of people are falling back on now. They're not having that anymore. Their their moral compasses don't line up. Their characters don't line up. And they're looking external for things to be mad about or to get their validation for. So I kind of saw that rot in society a little bit. There's mm -hmm. a lot of different words for different kind of antidotes you can kind of pinpoint. And it's, you know, I keep coming back to you know confidence in who you are, uh, humble confidence, being confident and and humble. Uh, if you're confident without humility then that's just ego and ego is no good right. so i think i embodied that through my life story and um it's a fun cool crazy ride and i think sharing that could help some people so i finally i had some different uh talks i, was, I organized for middle school high school kids and mentorship programs and had a lot of content and i got some writing groups and got some info hey what should i do with this and a couple people said just write the whole book write it all out be done mm -hmm. with it, and then you can pick pieces you want out from there, but the book is out there. People know who you are. And then I was going to write like a 400-page like novel, like deep character development, and a really like strong book. And who's, who's your target audience? Like 
these kids aren't reading 400 pages. They're not reading Harry Potter anymore this year, right? They're not, they're not doing that. I'm not good enough to write that anyway. So, so I made it like 150 pages, all the stories, a couple of philosophical um, themes that I weave in there. One's a ship of thesis and one's my who versus what kind of thing. And I kind of weave that into my story arc of you know, where I am and where I'm going and what I've done and why I've done it. And um, I'm going to take that out to the world and, and hopefully people uh, resonate with people and it helps a few people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds good. I, I love, uh, I love books like that. So growing up, I was always reading um, self-help books. Oh. After a while, I felt like I couldn't relate to the people anymore. Um, it was almost as if a lot of people had written books after they became successful and then were writing from the viewpoint of somebody who was successful. But it was hard to it was hard for me to relate to that because I was not yet successful and I needed to know about the struggles. I needed to know about all of the things that you encountered on that journey. And it seems like that's what your book. I'm going to read your book. I'm definitely going to read your book. But um, I, I um, I just I, I'm looking forward to taking in that that part of the book. You know, the part that's not so glamorous. Yeah, you know, sure. because because it makes this side looks beautiful, <laughs> you know, yeah. and it gives yeah. you something to keep fighting for. Exactly, right. and I think people see a big you know, stunt man and. Uh, people are afraid to be vulnerable. Like most of that book is how I failed at a lot of things and didn't do the right thing and mm. wish I had a better relationship with my father. And it's not, it's not a highlight reel <laughs> by any means. Right. Uh, but I think a lot of people, younger people, especially for, you know, other obvious reasons, adolescence and maturity, people are afraid to be vulnerable, put yourself out there. They, they have the Instagram life and here's how perfect my life is. Let me get this filter. Mm. Here's how I'm on this boat. And uh, like, no one's like, ah, got fired or you know the, the the realness is people are starving for it i think like right. even like you're saying they self-help people they write a book called how to make a million dollars and the first page is write a book called how to make a million dollars and sell it <laughs> uh, okay that didn't help anybody but they made a million dollars but it works people there's so much volume now everything's a volume-based business so you, there's probably nine thousand podcasts that mm -hmm. each get five thousand ten thousand you got rogan he gets a hundred million whatever he you know Mm -hmm. viewers he gets and so there's enough people that kind of support that too like the volume market now is huge so right um that creates an avenue for charlatans to come in and be louder or be more aggressive or be more showy be more flashy and that's been happening for a while and people i think are starved for just someone real who just you know mm -hmm. can be vulnerable and here's what helped me it might not help you it's not for everybody but um you get nuggets out of everyone's little story. And I think there's a lot less vulnerability in the world than there was previously. Right. Yeah. I agree with you. I, I do. Um, I think, I think it's a lot less, actually, I think it's two different extremes now. I sure. think there's a lot less, I think there are a lot more people who are not showing their vulnerability. And then a lot of people who are showing their vulnerability a little too much. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Getting attention from them either way. They're, they're yeah. driving for the attention in the wrong ways. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's it's an uncomfortable balance that's going sure. on right now. So, and then with social media, we get to see it all. Yeah. So, and I mean, both, both those two extremes are just ramped up. You don't see the middle. Yes. Like 90% of them are in the middle, but you only see they ramp up the two edges and, and all that. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's easy to see them because they're the loudest. They're the loudest. <laughs> they're, they're the loudest, but you know, the thing is, just because you know, when you're the loudest person in the room, you're oftentimes the hardest person to hear. Yeah, correct. You become white noise. And they don't yeah. yeah, no substance to it. No. Right. Yep. Yep. So, okay, man, I'm gonna put the uh, picture of your book up one more time just so people can see it. Um, for falling down to find myself. Um, again, I have not read this book yet, but just based off of your description of it and what I have learned about you, I already know this is going to be an incredible book. It's going to be an incredible read. It's going to be very inspiring. Um, so I cannot wait. I cannot wait to read this book. And, it, and it's a quick read. It's only 150 pages. People mm -hmm. do it over the weekend. Uh, one of the motivating factors of the size of it was I want to ship like 100 copies to a high school have the kids mm -hmm. read it over two weeks and come to the school and talk about it two weeks later and right. have it that digestible where so that's kind of the uh, 
the uh, strategy of it, the length of it and how it's written. Mm -hmm. So where can people find the book? Uh, Amazon and my publisher says anywhere books are sold. So Amazon books a million. There are no hard copies in like Barnes and Nobles and everything. That's a whole, mm -hmm. like I didn't know anything about writing books or publishing. I, I, I learned a lot. Um, it's a whole different kind of angle to get it into the stores where they could order it anyway. So Amazon's the best spot to find it. Uh, I have a website, uh, kevincast.com, K-E-V-I-N-C-A-S-S.com. Um, there's a pictures and videos of a stunt career and little blurbs about me, a link to the book, uh, other things that I do. So uh, all this is pretty new. I've retired from Hollywood about two years ago, opened up this business. I took a year and a half, wrote the books. I'm just starting this, this venture of getting this out there. Uh, so it's all kind of a... I haven't really been on LinkedIn much because Hollywood doesn't use LinkedIn. So I'm learning how to be on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm already too. I get it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, <right>? trying. I'm <laughs> trying. <laughs> <laughs> what um what what has it been like um adjusting to life outside of Hollywood for the past two years? Like like everything, pros and cons. Um, a lot more pros being around family and around my kids all the time. And mm. the con of that is like I was in. As a young man, I'm you know a little alpha male. I go out and kill a buffalo or be out and I. If you're home too much, you know I'm kind of I'm kind of really wanting to go out on location for a month right now. <laughs> so yeah. I almost overcorrected to where mm -hmm. uh, everything I built now is I'm home, which is great. But right. I, I need I need a little bit of elbow room uh, mm -hmm. with three kids under six. So yeah. <laughs> that comes. <laughs> my wife my wife's awesome, and we we work together to you know I'll go out and play golf or. Uh, we, we we got a pretty good team going so mm -hmm. uh it's a different life though than a learn about other people and mm -hmm. i used to be you know a breadwinner and now i'm not i kind of left that behind to try to make some money in the business and everything now right. my wife's holding down the fort on that so that's a whole different mental change and mm -hmm. um so all, all those adjustments are they're not they're fun they're not fun they're just i need a challenge i need to have that in front of me mm -hmm. even uh, doing stunts, I was at a level where the phone would ring. I take a job, make some money. It was all good, and it just got a little bit boring. And <laughs> taking away from my family, then it was really the pull. Okay, I'm not passionate about this anymore. I'm right. not climbing any more ladders. I don't want to be a director. I don't want to go any further in this life. Done it. Check. Now what else is the next step? So, mm -hmm. um, and that well, the book was part of that. So, so as as an alpha male, how does that affect you? Uh, you being home being the stay-at-home dad and your wife being out being the breadwinner uh we we got a good partnership it's just for a lot of people it'd be like ego but i've uh, my ego's been gone a long time I've, I've had so many l's in my life i don't have much mm -hmm. ego anymore so uh, -huh. uh I, I don't mind any of that i have no qualms about that uh right and i know i've always said I, no matter what where if i'm i'll be okay i'll put food in the table i'll get a job i'll work you know third shift we're gonna be fine we're workers you know we're, right. at the end of the day and i can always jump down can do movies have all those connections we have a lot of safety nets as far as career and finances if anything hit the fan we got we got avenues to, to to pursue all that so that makes it feel you know, a little less stressful you mm -hmm. know that's not all on her shoulders not all on my shoulders we're kind of like 50 50. um in theory not anymore we're like 70 30 now but okay. yeah. <laughs> uh, well, hopefully the, this, the business and the book and the speaking, that all kind of adds to it. And so mm -hmm. I, if I had a big ego, it'd be tough, but I don't right. really care about any of that. I, I, I love being around my kids and mm -hmm. I don't want, I don't want anybody else influencing them, putting their hands on them and their not hands on them, but their mentality or their getting into yeah, their I head. And I, hate, mm -hmm. I, I want, you know, I'm a tough love daddy, a lot of hugs, mm -hmm. a lot of kisses and a lot of punishments if you had to like <laughs> you know, I, if i say the ipad is going away it's going away and the more you cry right. it's going away for a day a week a month don't get don't i said don't get me daddy out here me daddy's coming out here in three seconds <laughs> <laughs> yeah so. you never want to like punish them by you know making them do some stunts like okay you do that again i'm gonna make you jump off the roof that's onto right. this airbag <laughs> <laughs> that's coming you know my middle one will do it my middle one's gonna be a stunt one i was gonna say they will love that <laughs> they would love it yeah they would like i own a ninja warrior gym they're in that ninja warrior gym flying off stuff they're airbags in there they're 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 balls and wall they're awesome mm -hmm. <laughs> that's cool man I, I love that i absolutely love that 
<laughs> All right, man. Well, look, we are going to go ahead and wrap up now. Um, do you have anything coming up or anything that you just want to share? Anything you want to promote? Uh, not just the book and uh, my website. Um, I'm I got into it the uh, Charlotte Mecklenburg school system. I'm going to do some new teacher training, which I thought was pretty neat. Kind of fell into that. I have some meetings mm -hmm. next week. Uh, a friend of mine is a big teacher in this area, and she said all the messages from my book be really relevant to new teachers as well. Because you're only a, to be a better teacher, the more confident you are, the more humble you are, the more you know, the more you find your who over that what battle. Becoming mm -hmm. you become a better person in a lot of as, a lot of aspects of your life. And a lot of people coming out of college, getting into education, there's no money, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, not mental health problems, but definitely room to, you know, toughen some people up and get them in a better place to be better teachers, which I didn't right. think. So there's a lot of avenues that are popping up all over the place that I, I'm hoping I can help a little bit here and there with. So we'll see where it takes me. All right. Sounds good, man. <laughs> Um, okay, so before we get out of here, I have one more picture that I'm going to put up here, and I just want you to tell me exactly what it is that you see. Okay? All right. All right. This podcast is so dope. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And I couldn't agree more. I love it. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time, Kevin. I appreciate it, man. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, I, I appreciate I appreciate how open and honest you are. Um, I know I'm going to when I when I uh, start reading this book, I'm going to see even more of your openness, your transparency, your, uh, you know, honesty. I'm, I just I just can't wait to really get into that and see all that, that it has um, to offer. Um, I have a feeling that reading this book is going to contribute to the growth of a lot of people. Uh, that's the goal. Hopefully. Yeah. 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 Uh, myself included. <laughs> anyway, we never stop growing once you think you stop you're, you're lying to yourself <laughs> exactly exactly yes all right so all right. again kevin i thank you and for everybody out there watching y'all be good to each other uh thank you sir